I was 17 when I first used marijuana. At first it started off as something that was social. My friends were smoking pot and I was like the, you know, the good student who never touched a drug. I had a curfew, I was obedient to my mom <laughs> and I decided that I wanted to step outside of that. In college, I joined the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and uh, there was a culture, both in college and in the Reserve Officer Training Corps, to drink, um, and that also extended into my military career as well, in the Air Force. I was the only black queer officer at that time, and Don't Ask, Don't Tell had just got repealed my junior year of college. That's when I came out the closet. And so when I first got to that base as an officer, I did feel really isolated. I felt really alone. And it was easy to pick up a substance and, and wallow in my sadness. While I was in the Air Force, I got UAID, uh, which is a urinary analysis. I popped hot for marijuana and I got kicked out after that. And that's when I knew that I had a problem. And so when I came here, the problem continued to escalate. I ended up leaving my housing and living in my car. Sure enough, my car got towed and I ended up homeless. And from there, my curiosity of substances became a curiosity of needles. I shot up crystal meth for the first time. I gained and anger towards society. And so being under the influence of crystal meth and homeless allowed me to lash out and express that anger. And it, it was therapeutic to use meth in a world where people are being killed because they're black. Babies are a 12-year-old boy named Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio was shot by cops and killed because he had a BB gun. Why should I contribute any value to a world like that? I started using needles when I first was homeless out in Golden Gate Park. At some point, it was nighttime. Nobody had a clean. And I used someone's dirty needle the LGBT Center, they had this thing called Youth Meal Night. And so I was going there to, of course, just you know get a meal. But they had um, the St. James Infirmary there to do testing, which was awesome. Sure enough, I received news that I had both HIV and Hep C antibodies. The first test was December of 2014. The confirmatory test was February of 2015. When I first found out, I did not think that it was a death sentence. In fact, I was told, this is not a death sentence. <laughs> the medications are highly advanced. There were multiple people who literally tracked me. And, and they would, even while I was homeless, they would sit down and talk to me at a coffee shop to try and encourage me to take the steps towards healing. They let me know that I should probably take meds. I denied it. I didn't want to. How am I gonna have medical adherence as a homeless person who gets my shit stolen? I get my shit stolen every other day. I didn't think that it was possible. And I'm glad that I experienced that because I started to verbalize that once I started working with another clinic called San Francisco Community Health Center. And the doctor there, <laughs> she touched my chakra. <laughs> she was like, you deserve love. And I was like, what in the hell? <laughs> and so once she said that, that's when I felt like I had a team of people who were gonna teach me how to do this. And sure enough, that's when I was put on a treatment plan. Treating myself was not just about medication adherence. It was also about a spiritual development to love myself with these conditions. There was a lot of self-hatred in me that I started to realize while I was under the influence of these drugs. And um, 
when I came to San Francisco, that's when I decided to accept who I am, both being queer and using substances and to learn what it means to love those parts of me. It was hard to, to do that though when I live in a world that does not love me for those very reasons and for many other reasons. I'm also black. There isn't a huge black community out here in San Francisco where when a person of color finds out that they're HIV positive, there's like swarmed with a village of people who are like, this is how you do it now. I went to jail more times than I have fingers. I got court ordered to a rehabilitation treatment facility called the Salvation Army Harbor Light Center. And I graduated. And I have not touched crystal meth or heroin since then. That was where I kind of had an awakening a spiritual one, um, where I kind of felt like I had a, a higher calling to learn how to take what my higher power has placed inside of me and my experience and extend that outwardly. How to spiritually love myself with all of the emotions that I have, the anger and the sadness, and then to find maybe some joy in the fact that I'm positive. Because I can influence the creation of a community and I guess help others who use substances. Community is everything to me. The role that it plays in my recovery is that I have multiple realms of communities. So there's the 12 step community. I'm welcome back, you know, even after relapses with the same or even more love. Another community that I am, am really a part of is the harm reduction community. And I think that's, the, that's probably one of the most important communities that I need to be a part of because that's what keeps me not feeling shame and stigma about my past. There are people who are currently using who show up for me and they, they, they love on me and they encourage me to continue on my path. And there's also the fitness community. And that's where I learn about the amount, the amount of power that I have within me. Just because I'm HIV positive does not mean that I cannot run. Just because I'm HIV positive does not mean that I cannot stand. I can get up and I can do some amazing things when I do that. When I take a step forward, it's, it's just like a whole multitude of people's lives become impacted by my hope. When I, when I was using crystal meth, I did not see past what was right here. All I saw was here. My, my arms, my veins, that was it. And so when I come around to someone who may have that same kind of vision and they begin to realize that maybe they can look up to the hills, that's when they start realizing that they can get up, that they can take a step forward, that they can have medication adherence, even when they're homeless. They can get a locker now. You know, we're, we're talking about the struggles instead of continuing to allow folks to struggle. The legacy that I would like to leave behind is creating tangible equality that everybody can feel, not just black people, everybody. Getting rid of all the indoctrinated hatred. People who have hate in their heart coming out and saying, I have it, I don't want it no more. Somebody help me get rid of it and having just people just surround them with love and show them like, yeah, you got love in you. Yeah, you do for you and everybody else. Yeah, you do. And we don't, we don't have to kill each other anymore. I, that, I want that to be my legacy. It's possible to have true equality that we all can feel. And not just here in the Bay. Universal love. Yeah. Hell yeah. God, it made me cry. Look. <laughs>